recording now. Good. Okay. So today we're discussing stigma and what role does it play when we look at cases of sexual torture. Um, and today we're testing a new format uh, for these sessions. We were looking at a more dynamic discussion uh, around the topic, uh, rather than having the speakers presenting a PowerPoint for 15, 20 minutes as we normally had. Um, the way we will do it is that I will be posing questions to, to our three fantastic panelists today. Um, mm -hmm. But we would actually like you and, and we would encourage you to raise your hand and go on mic um, if you want to share something at any time. So you don't need to wait for the Q&A um, session or at the end of, um, of presentation. So um, we're looking more at kind of a Q&A conversation format. So feel free to, um, to raise your hand or go on mic, as I said. That's why I will also uh, leave it. Um, we will not be sharing screen. So I will put the speaker view on, but then we can see each other's faces. Right. And if with any other further matter, I think we can start. I will present the panelists of today. We have uh, Eugenia Mpande. She was, she's the program development and quality manager at Tree of Life Zimbabwe. You might have seen her in, in other spaces. Um, Christy Fugio, she was also at the, at the previous session. She's the executive director and co-founder at Synergy for Justice. And Shirete uh, Tahiri Sileimani, I hope I said it correct. <laughs> um, she's herself survivor of sexual torture from the Kosovo War and also member of the IRCT's uh, Survivor Advisory Board. So with that, and please feel free, the three of us, when, when you get the chance to add to anything uh, to introduce yourselves. But um, first of all, I would like to start uh, maybe taking one minute to understand uh, the fine stigma and, and how it can manifest. And I will refer to a report that on the expert panel and workshop organized by the UN Voluntary Fund for Victims of Torture, where they discuss surviving torture and fighting stigma, the road to recovery for victims of yes. sexual and gender-based torture, which mm -hmm. I will be sharing in a second in the chat with you. Mm -hmm. And they actually say, and I quote, stigma related to sexual torture refers to the negative social attitudes, sh shame, and blame placed on survivors, their families or communities due to the occurrence of sexual violence. It says uh, that this stigma can manifest in various harmful ways, such as victim blaming, where survivors are held responsible for their violence, sorry, the violence they endured, or through social ostracism, reje rejection, or isolation. In many cultures, sexual violence is seen as dishonoring, not only the victim, but also their family, leading to further marginalization and discrimination. Now, with, with this, um, I would also like to take us uh, and refer to the Special Rapporteur on Torture, uh, Torture's latest report, um, which I will also share in the, in the chat if you didn't get a chance to look at it uh, in the last session which actually emphasizes or um, calls for a change or shifting the shame and stigma to, to perpetrators, um, stating, stating that it should not stay, uh, well, not stay within uh, with survivors and their families, but that, and actually now I will quote, it says, the stigma or shame must rest, must rest wholly on the perpetrators. Um, we can also say that Sexual torture is gender, as perpetrators then exploit uh, social norms around sex. So introducing an element of shame and social stigma, um, or that stigma is one of the many gender consequences of sexual torture. Um, now with that, uh, so this is what we will be discussing today, right? Stigma and how it impacts the, the whole cycle 
uh, when working with um, individuals who have been subjected to sexual torture. And now I will uh, go to you, Christy, because at Synergy for Justice, you have been working um, to reduce stigma associated with sexual torture in Syrian communities for seven years. Um, and you mentioned in, uh, so Christy shared a document uh, with a kind of bullet points of how this, this intervention went. And in the document that you shared, you mentioned um, the, that the scale and nature of sexual violence in, inflicted against Syrians will have long lasting destructive effects due to the aggravating effects of stigma which is why it has been developed, sorry, deployed so effectively as a weapon of war by different sides involved in the conflict. Now, what, what is it that makes it uh, such an effective weapon of war, Christy? If you can expand on that, why yeah. is it that effective? Thank you. Thank you, Berta, and thank you to the IRCT for hosting, and thanks to all the participants for joining us today. So, the systematic sexual torture occurring in Syria has ruined lives, destroyed families, and destabilized communities. Shame resulting from stigma is extremely powerful because it generates divisive and destructive social behaviors. It drives people apart. It's also closely related to depression, anger, self-harm, anxiety. Systematic sexual torture is an effective weapon because of the shame and blame, as you mentioned, Berta, the shame and blame that communities place on the survivors and also that they place on each other. And then how communities respond to the violence determines to what extent the survivors can heal from that violence. So as you mentioned, stigmatization is a social process that leads to the marginalization of people, it's when we see some kind of a stain or a taint on their character because of something about them, an experience they had, something they endured. And it involves, stigma involves placing blame on the people for letting it happen, for letting it happen to themselves, for letting it happen to others, and shame on the survivor because somehow maybe they deviated from the standards of the community or you know something is different about them now. And then in patriarchal societies, which of course most of our, maybe all of our societies are patriarchal, but some much more than others, the concepts of honor and shame are deeply connected and interwoven with, and then tied up in that is the rigid construction of gender roles. So when we think about honor, for example, we tend to, think, particularly in patriarchal societies, you know, we're thinking about men and how they have achieved honor through strength, dominance, protecting their family, things like that. Whereas in regard to women, there's more of a tendency to think of women of losing the honor, of losing their honor or losing the family's honor through shame and the perceived loss of purity, modesty, obedience, something like that when sexual torture happens or even when there's the perception that it happens. I want to point out that it often happens that when women are arrested or detained, even if they haven't experienced sexual torture or any sexual violence at all, there's an automatic assumption that they have experienced it and the stigma attaches automatically. So it's very powerful, the, the sort of the, the rigid ideas and assumptions that, that encircle this, particularly encircle women. So when sexual torture and violence happens, there's a variety of reactions, all playing into stereotypes, assumptions, and preconceived notions that we have. This variety of reactions, negative reactions mostly emerge. So when women are sexually tortured or taken away and assumed that it's happened, men are blamed often, or maybe they blame themselves because they feel like they should have protected the women. The women themselves are also of course blamed and shamed because somehow there's an assumption that how did they let this happen? What did they do that led to this happen to them? Somehow that it's their fault. And then often when they return after, after the violence, they may be isolated in their own households or often even they're sent away from the community entirely because maybe there's a fear that they're pregnant or um, just because of the shame and the stigma around the, the sexual assaults. 
Um, so as a side point, I should note that in Syria often, a lot of women go missing and it's unclear whether they have been arrested and detained by the regime or by other forces or whether perhaps the family has simply sent them away. Anyway, focusing blame on women, controlling their behavior, isolating them at home or sending them away, restricting their freedom and rights, Obviously, this all has extremely harmful consequences on women, on gender equality, and on justice. Now, for the men who have experienced sexual torture, they feel such an intense shame that very few of them will even disclose it to anyone. So they're usually not accessing services. They're not even living their lives. They, their family relationships suffer. And there's often an increase in domestic violence, which of course then has radiating impacts as well on the family, on the community. In the Syrian context, a survivor of sexual torture may also be suffering from other social stigmas too, related to maybe seeking mental health support, maybe they're a divorcee, displaced, um, maybe they're unable to make a living. So when you have someone coming out of detention or coming out of an arrest situation where they've been sexually tortured, they have to deal with that stigma. And frequently then there are other stigmas they're dealing with as well. So we have multiple layers of shame and stigma that are tearing apart individuals, families, and communities. And so these are some of the reasons why sexual torture is such an effective weapon to, to divide people and to really destroy communities. Oh, I was muted. Thank you, Christy. Um, I think actually now uh, I will also turn then to Eugenia because um, uh, I mean, in our conversation preparing this session um, and discussing mm -hmm. discussing the, the role of stigma in, in sexual torture, you, you also mentioned that it is um, effective to silence and punish survivors and families. Um, do you maybe if, if you want to if you have anything to add on what Christy has just mentioned, but also if you want to expand on this silencing of effect and why why is this effective? And the punish element. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, Beta, and greetings everyone. Uh thank you so much. Um so in our Zimbabwean context, um stigma um plays a very critical and destructive role. Um, in fact, it actually magnifies the suffering of the survivors and not only the survivors, like Christy mentioned, but their families as well. Um, it does not only subject them to trauma, but also create barriers to healing, the healing process that they so much need, uh, they can't access because of the stigma uh, it also affects uh, their access to justice because of the fear, um, fear that they might actually uh, be sexually violated again. Um, and reintegration into the community becomes a challenge as well. And uh, the silencing also um, is a huge thing in our context. Um, and the survivors continue to suffer. And this suffering uh, perpetuates cycles of abuse, okay, by other perpetrators. Um, and I totally agree with Christy. There are multiple and multiple layers of the abuse. Um, usually the torture um, that is related to organized violence and torture will target the same group of people the same activists, so they continue to suffer in silence. We have had people who have come to our workshops uh, telling that, telling us that they've never opened up, they've never said anything. They would rather die in silence than mention anything about the abuse or seek support. I think that's what I can say for now. Over. Mm. Thank you, Jean. I think this is powerful enough to say, I mean, if they would rather die than disclosing, this is um, mm -hmm. enough for us to understand how how powerful it is in terms of uh, silencing. I will go to Arish um, Semren. Uh, if you want to share in uh, your experience with uh, 
with working with torture survivors in Syria. Arish? Yes, hello. dear. Um, thank you. Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, again, this is Arish Simbrin from Jordan. I'm a protection manager and clinical psychologist working with one of the national organizations here in Jordan. And I would like to share just our experience as I'm a psychologist and working with torture survivors since 2008. So, and after that, um, I'm working with Syrian refugees who are flooding to Jordan. So I totally agree of uh, the situation of the torture survivors who is exposing, especially the sexual torture type, because a stigma, it's not easy issues in the Middle East and it's in Arabic culture. And uh, I can see that there is a difference between men and women who are seeking the services, the psychological services, and when they are also letting us know in more details what's going on when they were kidnapped or arrested from different groups, even the Syrian military or other unknown groups and regions. So we can see that there is a high effect of trauma after they exposing actually sexual torture. And we can see that men, especially men, we can see that they couldn't at the beginning saying any things or sharing their sexual torture experience, especially with their families and especially with their wives, because they thought that if they share this experience with their wives, their wives, they will not accept them again as a husband and they will not accept them as the one who's a householding and taking the responsibility of their families, especially the protection issues. Then I can see that there is a different level of stigma, actually. Uh, the, the first level uh, is individual level, which is, uh, uh, which is connected with the same survivor or the same victim. And what is the stereotype, the concept that they have it after they exposing this type of violence. And also, what they're going to do after they, uh, for example, coming back for their communities and with their families. So they have, we can see that some of the survivors, they have a, a, a stigma and they start to blame themselves, feeling shame, especially actually men, because it's something related and connected with the owner, something related uh, with their gender role in the community. The second level of stigma, we can see it clearly on the family. So families started to uh, developing and improving the stigma issues uh, uh, for men and women. So sometimes we can see that, unfortunately, family, they didn't provide any support, like especially the psychosocial support for these survivors. Uh, uh, and also they didn't accept them again. Uh, uh, they start to have that uh, uh, thinking regarding their new role in the family. The woman actually, sometimes when they're exposing sexual torture and they have a, they start to be a pregnant, they sometimes refuse from their families. So and also they start to behave with them in, in a very negative way and also sometimes they uh, start to be very aggressive and they didn't uh, giving them any uh, spaces to move and to go outside. So like this woman Unfortunately, they went to the family protection department and they went to the, some NGOs and asking them for some assistance. And uh, at, at the end, they re referred them to the shelters for more protection and for more assistance. For men, the family is starting to see this men in different roles. Uh, they start to, uh, sometimes they're blaming them uh, and they, um, uh, they didn't supporting them uh, to... Uh, to be very active again and to have that good uh, uh, role. For the community level, we can see that there is also the stigma on the community level. So sometimes communities, they didn't accept the survivor again and to engaging them in the community activities. But what we did actually through our work, we start to raising the awareness of these communities and to start to they stood to accept this survivor again. We stood to have that uh, campaigns and uh, uh, some uh, community engagement uh, activities, some awareness sessions for the community regarding the sexual tortures and what's going on for these people who's arrested or kidnapped. And we will not 
uh, uh, blaming them. We should be supporting them again from the community. And also we can see that some survivors, especially Syrian uh, survivors, because they uh, disconnected from their communities, so heavy for them again to come back and to engage in the community and to have that good social network. So we can see that some survivors, after coming back to their homes and to their communities, start to withdraw and isolated, and they have some negative uh, thinking and attitude towards the communities. So they uh, also, if the communities uh, didn't have that a good psychosocial support mechanism, unfortunately, they will fight each other again and having a new things and a new trauma. So it, actually, still currently, days we received many of torture survivors, and you know, I'm I'm specialized in the narrative exposure therapy. And this is one of the most important intervention and treatment, especially for the complex trauma and complex uh, cases. And you know, the sexual torture is we consider it as one of the sexual, uh, uh, one of the complex trauma because the affected and long-term consequences, especially the sexual. So when I'm when I'm starting to conduct these uh, or practice these interventions with the survivor, I can see that. It's overwhelmed and heavy trauma story they have it. And it's so difficult for the survivors to break this trauma uh, or to tell us their trauma story and to uh, uh, letting us know in specific details what's happening with them. So I totally agree with what Christina and uh, the other colleagues said. And really, we need, I'm looking as one of the experts in Jordan, we are looking to have that structures and will organize intervention and prevention programs, especially to reduce the stigma okay. issues. And to also, at the same time, we need to have that structured program for the community to support again this survivor. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I'm I'm talking a lot, but this is our experience, really. No, no. It was. It's really. It's really interesting, Aris. So you you went through these uh, three layers of uh, of. Um, stigma impacting at individual level, family level, and then the wider community, uh, stigmatization by the wider community. And then also you you were explaining how it, uh, especially um, the, the the specific impact on, on men and their yeah. genderized uh, role. I, I wanted to ask you, Arish, can you, can you um, let us know which, which is the organization you're working for in Syria? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not working in Syria. I'm working in oh. Jordan. So Sorry. it's uh, a Institute for Family Health. Okay. Uh, but also, I'm working with different organizations, national organizations, mm. as uh, experts there. So mm. uh, and uh, currently, I did uh, some missions with the United Nations, mm. and um, uh, for Syria, uh, sometimes we are working remotely with the people there because it's so difficult to be there in these times, especially in these uh, times. So mm -hmm. sometimes we are providing uh, these services uh, remotely. Uh, and also, you know, dear, I um, I conducted uh, currently um, a, a lot of trainings and capacity building training, especially for the service providers to at least understand well what's the meaning of torture, what's the meaning of sexual violence, what's the, what about mm -hmm. the character uh, that uh, the survivors, uh, they are sometimes after long terms in the presence and exposing uh, a heavy sexual uh, mm -hmm. violence and torture, they coming back with a new character, sometimes with a new thoughts, with a new feeling. So that's why the, we should to build the capacity of the service providers to understand these characters. And, mm -hmm. and because uh, the men, uh, they didn't speak uh, frankly with their families what's happening with them. They can, in our culture, they can't speak uh, b b frankly and honestly regarding if they're exposing Muslim physical torture, uh, psychological torture, but sexual, so difficult issues to let their families or what's going with them in the presence, for example. Mm -hmm. So that's why the capacity building for the service providers is very mandatory and very important for them and how they can also 
support these uh, uh, survivors. So, yes, by this yeah. way, yani we hope we can do something. Yeah. No, thank you, Arish, for sharing. And the reason why I'm asking is because uh, you were mentioning this, uh, that you were with uh, raising awareness in community to, to fight stigma. And we'll, this is something that we will be touching um, also upon today with uh, with Christie's experience work, the, the experience with Synergy for Justice in Syria. But yeah, thank you so much, Arish, for, for sharing. I'll now move on. We have a couple of uh, hands and questions. I'll move on to Joel, if you want to... Go on mic, Joel. Hi. Introduce yourself. <laughs> yes, Hello. I'm Joel. Uh, I'm from Lebanon. I'm currently a school counselor at a school and I'm pursuing my master's in clinical psychology. I just kind of wanted to uh, add on to what Arij was saying because uh, here in the Middle East, I feel like this topic is very much needed to be talked about more because for example in the middle east when it comes about um sexual torture and stigma on it it goes to the extreme so here in the middle east there are things called honor crimes or honor killings where the men in the family feel like um they should kill for example in this case that i'm giving an example about the woman because her modesty was taken away her purity her innocence so they feel like in order to avoid the shame that was brought upon the family, they think it is right to kill her. And a lot of the times this is overlooked and it is ignored because this is culturally based, these uh, sanctioned beliefs about the woman's purity and innocence. So this is something that's uh, very important to take into consideration when thinking about why people don't speak up more about this topic, you know, especially even males when it happens to them. And um, yeah, like even recently, I saw a case where the woman was a victim of rape at her workplace and someone in the in the chat was talking about sometimes they videotape them for the purpose of extortion. And uh, she was too afraid. She was seeking help because she's too afraid to even tell her husband or tell others because she has this idea because of the stigma, she will be the one to be blamed for this, especially here in the Middle East, in Lebanon and um, these uh, sorts of countries. So that's it. Just, I know it's a very important topic to be taken into consideration. Ooh, some places uh, to the extreme more than others. Yeah. Thank you, Joel, for sharing. Um, and, and also with some, some of the examples of how far these uh, stigma, the impact of the stigma can go. Um, I'm aware there's a, a comment from Bojan from Gian Foundation from Iraq. I'm not sure, Bojan, do you feel like uh, sharing this together with everyone here by unmuting yourself? Or do you prefer me to read it? Yeah. Otherwise, we also have a hand from Adams. Aras, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I am Aras from Jean Foundation. I'm a head of program uh, Trauma Care and Health, and also I'm a psychotherapist. I'm working basically in Iraq, Kurdistan. Uh, especially about this um, interesting topic, especially about the stigma, it's very necessary in the field of the psychological aspect. So in the variety of the cases that we <clears throat> treated, especially in terms of mental health issue, for those uh, victims for sexual uh, violence in terms of rape in any other type of sexual, it uh, linked to the post-traumatic stress or the other diagnosis. So this uh, stigma is uh, some other aspect, especially in the psychological aspect. Uh, for the sexual violence is deeply uh, stigmatized in the most of societies. And uh, corporate resort, uh, most of the time, uh, leverage is this to uh, in, intens uh, intensity of psychological trauma. For example, the victims may feel intense of shame or guilt or any other kind of isolation, and they are, they are uh, feared or seek to uh, experience to to share in their experience as a as a stigma of the rape and sexual uh, uh, sexual uh, 
exploration. So it means that the psychological aspect of the system lead to the, the symptoms and don't allow the, the victims to share their experience in terms of psychological um, symptoms. In a, another kind or another aspect, it, it will be the uh, silencing and social isolation. Uh, for example, victims of sexual torture often fear a social rejection uh, for few uh, victimized in the uh, disclosure of their experience and uh, societies with strong tabos uh, around the circus wall may obstruct victims, blaming them and, for example, uh, for what happened uh, rather than supporting them in many countries, in many religions and community, uh, this created a culture of silence. So, uh, where is the perpetrators are really held accountable. In many um, area, in many stories, in the client's story, uh, the, the, the perpetrators go away with, our, with, with any of the accountable uh, help. So there's many uh, importance, very important to have a self-awareness uh, in terms of community to write in awareness about sexual tortures, how uh, they feel when uh, they, they expose to this issue and to increase their uh, self-confidence, to share their ex experience with uh, some specialized uh, to improve with their situation. So it means that we, we need to uh, clinical services and also community-based uh, intervention in terms of the society to write in awareness about the stigma and those things related to stigma. Especially the religion is very effective in this uh, regard. For example, we have many cases in Yazidi survivors uh, from the ISIS uh, flight. Many of the victims, they don't want to share their experience. Even the Mullah and Sheikh, they don't, uh, they don't accept it uh, about the, the sexual experience. After some negotiation in terms of community, religion, some other aspects after that, that the Muna and Sheikh decide to uh, rehabilitation and supporting as a, uh, as a community. In that regard, would be very beneficial for the victims of uh, torture and uh, sexual torture to be helped in this regard. Mm. Thank you, Ara. So, so, I mean, just, just to recap a bit, we're seeing um, we're, we're, we're seeing that there's a lot of different layers of, of stigma, but also intensity. Um, if we look at different contexts, for example, now the colleagues from Lebanon, um, Jordan and Iraq are sharing how, how this is extremely, um, it has a, a negative uh, repercussion and impact in, uh, in MENA region, and also the importance of, of awareness raising to, to combat um, stigmatization. Um, I'm, I see a lot of hands up, which is good. I'm going to go maybe uh, to Jian uh, uh, and then Boj Bojan, Andres, and Jeb Kemoy, so you know the order. Thank you very much, uh, Bertha. Um, my question is that stigma is the social con concept. It comes from the bystanders, the community, and it's also a universal uh, concept. I've been working for 31 years uh, supporting women who were tortured by their families. So it's non-state torture, but they have the same experiences that I'm listening to your presenters. So for me, what we've learned is there a need to really challenge bystanders and how what the terminology of sexual torture does, you know, what what is the meaning of that word? And by using it, are we creating more of a uh, reinforcement of the social biases that somehow sexual torture is different than physical torture? Sexual torture is physical, it's psychological, and it's spiritual. So my question is, uh, has anybody done any research to try to find out why the terminology creates such a global bias 
that we stigmatize and marginalize women or men who suffered physical so-called sexualized torture. Uh, I'd like to uh, hear um, how we can deconstruct the social biases. So thank you. Sorry, I was muted again. Sorry, uh, thank you, Jane. Um, I'm not aware of such studies, but I will share the special section that was published in 2018 uh, on, on sexualized or genderized torture uh, uh, on the Torture Journal. Uh, but if anyone here in the call knows about uh, studies uh, addressing this topic in particular, please share in the, in the chat if you can. Um, I'll go now to Vojan, then Andres, and last, Jeb Kemoy, and then we will move uh, on to Shiret. Thank you, Berta. Can you hear me, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. I just want to expand on what I wrote, and I think it's really important to think about the ways, I think it's also good to think about the construct of stigma and how it's used, but also the ways and good practices how to combat stigma and um, what happened in Iraq is that um, the Yazidi religious leadership accepted the women back in the community, which is not an easy thing, because according to the religion, even um, sexual intercourse with other religion throws out a person outside of the community. But this was done because there were so many people affected. It was actually a genocide. And it was really massive, so it could not be ignored. And this happens within a community, and the community should be the one um, subject to react. And there should be some um, work with the communities in order uh, to do something similar, which is not the same case uh, with other communities that were targeted by ISIS, which are also patriarchal, but because it was not on the scale as it was with Yazidis, um, the members of these communities uh, have a greater burden of stigma and they cannot even in some cases apply for reparations or speak what happened with them because of that. So we need to consider all of this in a context. Unfortunately, there is a limit to this because another attempt of the religious leadership to declare also children born out of sexual violence um, back to the community backlashed and this didn't work out, right? So we need to be realistic of what can be done and what cannot. Thank you. Thank you, Bojan. And actually you're touching upon a, a, a very important point that I think we, we will expand later. Um, and we will be um, well interested in hearing um, about this uh, role of religious leaders and when is it effective, when it's not. I think Christy will be sharing with us her experience. But I will now, um, we will now go to Andres and then Jeb Kemoy. Andres, si quieres desmotearte. Oops, I think we lost Andres. Well, Jeb Kemoy, you can go ahead. Oh. No, Andrés, ahora, ahora sí. Ahí está, sí. Ahora te escuchamos. Soy de Bolivia, eh, del Instituto de Terapia e Investigación sobre Secuelas de la Tortura y Violencia de Estado. Eh, cuando atendemos mujeres de comunidades que han sido violadas o mujeres de mineros que sufrieron violación, están entre la alternativa o bien no dicen nada, pero la sexualidad no funciona y el hombre tiene sospechas que está con otro hombre, por eso ya no lo, lo quiere tanto como antes. O si lo dice, como han contado los compañeros antes, eh, es, eh, la mujer está rechazada, ya no está reconocida como esposa. Esa es la situación la que vivimos bastante frecuentemente también aquí. Ahora, eh, el tema, por eso me parece fantástico que es, eh, el IST ha hecho propuestas de webinario sobre eh, estigma, y mi pregunta va más allá 
pero en particular por tema sexual, es que en el protocolo de Estambul tiene, hay muy poco espacio, no hay un espacio que reflexiona sobre el estigma. Entonces, a mí me parece muy importante en el sentido que el RCT, por ejemplo, comienza a trabajar en ese tema. También en posicionamientos de Naciones Unidas he encontrado muy poco. Um, y ahí va mi, mi pregunta, justamente, ¿qué trabajos han sido hechos? El artículo de Tocho no lo he leído, pero me interesa mucho saber uh, el dato. Uh, tenemos que trabajar ese tema urgentemente. Gracias. Mm. Sí, muchas gracias, Andrés. Thank you so much, Andrés. Is uh, is basically um, mentioning or, or flagging that uh, there is no mention of the uh, of stigma in the Istanbul Protocol or or in other instances. I think now, though, the the um, the attention has been brought, um, thankfully, to the well, to the with the special rapporteurs on torture report with Dr. Ali's report, which has a, a section only on on stigma. And shame. Um, but yes, thank you for for the comment, Andres. I think this is something uh, to note out of this discussion today. And this is also why we're having this uh, space today to only discuss uh, this issue. Uh, Jeb Kemoy, I'm, I'm going to go to you from CVT Kenya. And then uh, Olukemi, uh, if if you allow me to, um, I will go first to Sheret, and then we will continue with you afterwards. So, Jeb okay. Kemoy, if you want to go. All right, thank you. Um, just basically to acknowledge that uh, conflict-related sexual violence continues to be perpetrated in many conflict um, areas around the world. And most of the times it leaves the survivors with very um, bad consequences, either mental or physical. And I'll speak about a case of, um, uh, of a third world country, for example, where I work from in Ethiopia, where we have um, victims or survivors of uh, sexual uh, related um, violence and where also rape was used as a weapon of war. And many of these women and men have actually been left with uh, physical uh, disabilities in the sense that many of objects were insert inserted into their reproductive system, foreign bodies, and in the, in the process they had um, injuries that have left them with issues to do with fistula, incontinence, and all that. So these people even to access uh, the very basic medical care, leave alone the medical uh, reconstructive surgery, is very, very difficult. And therefore, the stigma in the community, everyone knows that the reason why so-and-so is having incontinence or the reason so-and-so is having this kind of problem is because they suffered this. So most of the times, these people just because physiotherapy, we can support them to some extent. But without reconstructive surgery to correct that, it's not possible. Without the mental health support to uh, support them to, I mean, to stabilize in whatever, it's also a big problem. So I agree that most of the time we hear stories of suicide because of levels of hopelessness in the community. So my question is, how do we support the survivors to endure the consequences of uh, conflict-related sexual violence, and especially when survivors have long-term forms of disabilities. Thank you. Thank you, Jeb Kemoy, for bringing this, uh, how these disabilities can can also have an impact and reinforce social stigma and the importance of reconstructive sur surgery. Um, I'm not sure if the if the if Christy or Eugenia, you want to um, you want to address her question. Or if you have anything to say, otherwise, I'll move on to Sherete. But I just want to make space here if anyone has any reflection. Yeah. Otherwise, I'll go to um, I'll go to Sherete because um, so Sherete is uh, the third panelist uh, with us. Perdón. Oh, sorry, Andres. Perdón, justo olvidé un punto. Sí. ¿Me permites, Berta? Sí, sí, sí. De mi punto de vista, necesitaríamos hacer un apoyo porque, como se mencionó hoy, claramente es un tema cultural. Y teníamos que crear instrumentos 
para revertir esa, con, las concepciones sí. culturales en las cuales enfrentamos. Tendría que ser um, como crear un día contra el estigma, y, pero hacer un trabajo uh, pedagógico, uh, psicológico, médico, crear un saber en esa lucha contra ese prejuicio muy defendido. Gracias. Gracias, Andrés. Thank you so much. Um, and yes, this is also making me aware that I have, uh, there's hands up from Olukemi and Bessie. Should we take them now? And then uh, I promise I go to you, Sherette. No problem. But maybe I'm thinking because these are, these might be related to something that is being discussed, so I don't want to cut it there. So Olukemi, if you want to go ahead and then we'll take Bessie. Okay, yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, I think uh, from this end, I, I, I work with Prawa Nigeria, and uh, from this end, the stigma, the role that stigma plays is quite heavy and huge. A lot of negativity. Aside the psychotraumas, we have social exclusions, social exclusions. Some of them cannot even get married anymore. You know, they are working in the society and they're like, oh, you mean you want to marry this person? No, 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 no. You know, you can do that. This person has been sexually abused and you don't know what you are going to meet there. That's a terrible social exclusion. Aside the cultural exclusions, there are some times that uh, you have cultural meetings, uh, you know, cultural uh, programs, and these people are excluded. And they're like, no, please don't even, don't, don't let them mix up. Don't let them mix up with us because you don't know the kind of uh, diseases they already have now, you know. Like uh, somebody previously mentioned, was it uh, areas I can remember? You know, that they, they are completely excluded from social and cultural norms, including, you know, uh, they, they are even not allowed to display their talent. Some of them are quite talented, but if you are excluded, you're not going to be able to be part of that. And um, I think there are lots of uh, policy pushing we need to do here aside the Istanbul Protocol, a lot of regional and national policy pushing, policies against stigmatization, policies against stigmatization. And uh, we also need to engage with uh, religious leaders, religious, especially in this part of the world, Africa, there's a lot of religion into everything that we are doing. So we need to engage with religious leaders, engage with traditional rulers, and see how these people can make the uh, survivors of to uh, sexual torture, you know, to have freedom of movement and freedom of expression like other people. Thank you. Thank you, Lokemi. So, so we're seeing, we're hearing again uh, the impact, the huge impact that stigma has on uh, at the at the community level um, from Nigeria, from um, Kenya, Iraq, Lebanon, um, uh, and. I think also, well, Bolivia. So, um, and also now, Olukemi, thank you. I think Olukemi is bringing a new um, element here on the, the importance on national and regional policy pushing to to engage with uh, with uh, awareness um, and also to engage with religious leaders to to reintegrate to help reintegrate uh, survivors into into society again. I'm gonna go to Bessie. And then Sherit and the other the other hands I'll take you after Sherit. <laughs> but I'm seeing you. So Bessie, si quiere, si quiere intervenir. Hola, saludos, me escuchan bien. Sí. Sí, bueno. Yo creo que el impacto de la violencia sexual es, eh, digamos, brutal, eh, independientemente de quién es el actor, ¿verdad? Pero cuando hablamos de la violencia sexual como violación de derecho humano, eh, creo que, hay, que es importante, y cuando hablan de estigma también, yo creo que esto es importante hablar también que cuando es de violación de derechos humanos hay algunas condiciones que agravan la situación. Por ejemplo, eh, en el caso de, de, de privados de libertad, 
ya son un tipo de población que eh, son, digamos, menospreciados y sufren una desvalorización eh, de, de parte de toda la sociedad. Cuando estas personas eh, sufren este tipo de violencia, eh, están en una situación, digamos, de mayor vulnerabilidad porque eh, están en un lugar encerrado. Generalmente los victimarios van a seguir ahí. Eh, en la experiencia lo que hemos tenido es que, eh, digamos, uh, el tema del, del, del silencio, obviamente que siempre, siempre pre prevalece por temas de, de salvaguardar, digamos, la vida, porque si hablan, pues, pues pueden ser sometidos a, a mayores actos de vejación o otros tipos de tortura. Eh, pero también... Eh, como los victimarios eh, tienen una condición de poder especial ahí, eh, eso hace que eh, salgan, digamos, con mayor eh, porcentaje de impunidad. Eh, teníamos el caso, por ejemplo, en una cárcel donde eh, un custodio eh, le dice, eh, según el testimonio, le, robó, le quitó las llaves a la custodia mujer eh, para meterse al hogar de mujeres y violó a una de ellas delante de, de todas las demás. Y la, la, la reacción que hubo, porque esto es en un contexto donde la cárcel estaba militarizada, o sea que fueron militares los que hicieron esto, eh, lo que hicieron fue trasladar a, la, a los victimarios, digamos, trasladarlos de cárcel, por ejemplo. Entonces el tema de... El, del, digamos, acceso de las barreras, de acceso a la justicia, del aislamiento social en el que ya se encuentran, eh, la revictimización, por ejemplo, eh, y la deshumanización es como males eh, agravados, digamos. Y creo que hay contextos también, como el tema eh, de los estados de sección, eh, nosotros llevamos desde el finales del 2022 en estado de excepción, continuos. Eso, eh, junto con la militarización del estado de Honduras, eh, ha incrementado eh, las violas, las, los actos de violencia sexual de parte de las eh, entes de, eh, digamos, militar, policías militares o fuerzas especiales, en este caso, digamos, contra maras y pandillas, que cuando van a hacer los allanamientos como parte eh, de ese ejercicio de poder desmedido eh, hacen uso de la violencia eh, de la violencia sexual estos casos igual por ser digamos a veces en la, la mayoría de denuncias que tenemos son de familiares de, de maras y pandillas entonces eh, ven la situación para denuncia pues como que no, no tienen credibilidad, ya tenemos algunas personas a las que se les ha rechazado recibirles la denuncia. Eh, tenemos casos donde se les, se les ha rechazado la atención médica básica en un, en, en un digamos, centro de salud, eh, en un barrio donde viven. Eh, entonces, yo creo que también cuando hablan de estigma, también impacta mucho el tema de la eh, falta de educación sexual que tenemos como sociedad, eh, falta de educación en tema de derechos humanos y por lo tanto de los impactos que podemos sufrir eh, y que alcanza no solamente la víctima, sino también a las personas que están al, alrededor y a la familia y en, en, en realidad pues a la sociedad en general, pues. Porque esto, este aislamiento, esta revictimización, este silencio, esta deshumanización, esta barrera de, de acceso a la justicia y la reparación, eh, al final solo incrementa, el, eh, digamos, las oportunidades que tiene el victimario para seguir haciendo lo, lo que hace, ¿verdad? Gracias, Creo que solamente. Sí. Ay, perdón. Muchas gracias, Bessie. So, so Bessie uh, is now. Um, bringing the perspective of uh, of uh, when these acts occur, occur uh, with uh, individuals deprived of liberty, and uh, she's speaking. Um, well, I guess you 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 got the interpretation. 
but just to bring in the this new pers this perspective of uh, how this hinders how they are prevented from accessing justice and and medical services when these acts happen in in prisons um she was also mentioning the i mean or relating it to the lack of sexual education and and basic rights um so thank you Bessie for for that perspective i'm going to go now to Sherette, so we make sure uh that uh that we have the perspective of Sherette, and then I'm going to go to Agnes, Arish, and Linda. So hang in there, please. Um, but Sherette, I would now uh, go to you because um, uh, as a survivor of sexual torture under the Kosovan war, um, we, I was wondering if, if you can explain a bit um, how you experienced this stigma. How did you deal with it um, in your case? Um, thank you so much for inviting me as a guest, and um, I am an um, uh, IRCT member, and it's just a wonderful organization. I am so proud to be a, a member of IRCT. Um, first of all, um, survivors are humans. So first, I'm a human, and second, I'm a survivor. I represent 20,000 voices of Kosovo, that they are silenced. Second, I'm the second survivor that I had a courage to come forward to ask for justice. Experience stigma against emotional distress can be incredibly isolating and painful. Through my journey, I learned that self-care, family, community, organizations, support, and most of all, advocating for a chance where the ways that I can cope with the hardship I faced during the time of my experience, experiencing my story. The stigma around sexual torture is very shameful in my culture. It is seen as a disgrace to bring up or to talk about that anyone in your close family, let alone the community or support groups. I knew that sharing my story could bring emotional distress as I grew up in this culture, I, I was taught that these topics are off the table all the times, regardless of the internal struggle and the pain. So, also. I'm just wondering, Charette, if, if uh, and you're speaking about um, emotional distress. Um, how 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 was how did you um, realize, or how did you let's say um, find the power within you to uh, share your story so that you would release this emotional distress? And how was it? How was your experience with sharing it with your family members, community, etc.? So before I begin my journey as towards experience the horrifying experience I faced, I was very afraid. I was afraid of what the people around me will think. What will they say? How will they react? What will my close family think of me? Would I be left? in the dark and shunned away. I was going against everything my culture taught me. I was going against the norm of speaking the truth of the to torture and many other faced during the war. I was trembling in a fear when my when first spoke 
of my experience in the war. But I knew deep down and I wanted others to see that they too can have a voice. I wanted my children to see that I was strong. Then my darkest demons and I will rise above, advocate and advocate for those who were just like me, paralyzed in fear of the stigma they will face. Thank you. Thank you, Shereti. Thank you so much for bringing your, your very valuable experience um, because obviously discuss, discussing stigma from, uh, from professionals who work uh, daily with torture survivors is not the same as hearing it um, from someone who has felt it in in her own skin. So thank you so much, Yvette, for for sharing. Um, but don't leave. We'll continue um, with with other perspectives. I'm now gonna gonna go to the new hands that are are raising here. Um, we have Agnes and then Linda, Muhammad and Arish. That's the order. So you can start preparing. So Agnes, if you want to go ahead and yeah. switch on your mic. Yes. Hello, Agnes. Oh, thank you for this uh, wonderful um, discussion that has been going on for some minutes now. For minutes now. And you see, when it comes to survivors of torture sexually, you find that the people find it very difficult to speak up. Okay, as I'm talking to you right now, there are some community members that are mentoring them regards to GBV, this gender-based violence. So why am I mentoring them? Because most times the 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 victim basically are people in the rural area. When this thing happens now, they find it difficult to speak up. So now I have we feel that they can easily communicate with these people with them, the same people in the same community than people coming outside. So we try to mentor these people. We told them you are not ambassador to your people. Any case of gender violence, any case of rape, sexual assault, you report to the person. And most times you, you find that, that people find it difficult to speak up, not only religious or um, traditional rulers have a lot of work to do. What if that person further victim? What if that person didn't speak up? This is an issue. So we try to sensitize people. See, when such case occur, try to speak up because you don't know the next victim. There is one that happened, I saw it online. And the person is not mentally stable. He's going about raping people in the community. Do you understand? Do you know how many persons are four victims? So if the victim doesn't speak up, do you know who is the next victim? Your sister, your, your, your wife, your daughter. So we try to sensitize people. I know that it's, it's not easy. It comes with stigma. People don't want to mingle with you. When you say, oh, you were being assault, people will look at you somehow. They try to segregate. Do you understand? So we need a lot of work. We need to go to the rural area, sensitize people. There is need for them to speak up, forget about the victim. Also, we need to sensitize the society regards to the victims of a sexual assault. So this is what I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Agnes. And Agnes, uh, she works at Prabwa, Nigeria. I'm just, uh, just, just so you remember to introduce yourselves. But uh, yeah, thank you, Agnes. Another yet again um, example on, or let's say, flagging the importance of, of sensitizing community um, uh, against stigma. Uh, I'll go now to Linda. And then next, Muhammad. Thanks, Bruta. So I, I work with Jean Sarson in Canada, and we work with women who've been tortured, primarily women who've been tortured by non-state actors. And I'm having, I'm struggling to ask this question because I'm feeling stigma when I ask it. Because the women that we work with are tortured by their families. They're, they're non-state torturers, but they're still tortured. They still have 
water torture when they're and raped when they're water tortured they're electric shocked uh, when they're being raped in their genitals they have uh, gang raping so it's all sexualized torture but because it happens in the family they're told that it's abuse that it's not torture so that's another layer of stigmatization that they endure, that they're not really torture survivors, that they're abuse survivors. They're labeled that way as healthcare workers, label them as abuse survivors. They're labeled that way by general society, by politicians, by other torture ex experts. And then in, in turn, our work is stigmatized and I'm stigmatized as, a, as an advocate for them because I'm working with really abuse survivors and I shouldn't be calling them torture survivors. So that to me, I'm emotional about that. Um, and I believe that a little girl that's sexualized, uh, gang raped by a, a whole line of men in her bedroom is every bit a torture survivor as a little girl that's raped on the war conflict field. There is no difference in the suffering that those two little girls are subjected to. The only difference is who the perpetrators are and the site of the torture. So it, whether it's in your house or whether it's on the battlefield or in a hut or a hotel, torture is sexualized torture is sexualized torture in my opinion. I feel very strongly about that and we've been working for many years to try to break the taboo about non-state torture and it's a very huge uphill battle so i thank you for um listening i don't know if you agree with me but i'm being deeply honest about the suffering that we listen to on a daily basis from women around the world thank you thank you linda and, and there's no uh no agree or disagree i think there are many opinions about that and and we appreciate that you share it uh with us um but yeah, this is this is a, a never-ending discussion. I noticed. Um, but thank you for bringing it up. I'm gonna give now the floor to Muhammad and then Arish. Uh, thank you so much, Berta. Uh, the situation in Pakistan is Berta uh, similar to the rest of the world. Uh, with the uh, uh, juveniles and male members uh, who are uh, taken uh, to the detention centers are uh, getting sexually harassed uh, and uh, molested. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, the stigma they are facing, uh, the rest of the uh, victims uh, are, are, are similar uh, in Pakistan. But it is. Uh, uh, but we have found uh, during the last 18 years working with the uh, uh, with the torture victims, especially in the prison, uh, it is really hard to persuade them uh, to share their uh, their stigma and their their ordeal with the with the uh, with the with the caregivers. So this not only uh, lead to uh, to their, uh, to their uh, uh, proper uh, treatment and providing them the services. Also, uh, taking the perpetrators to the justice and punishing them under the laws uh, 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 make it uh, very uh, difficult when somebody is not disclosing the trauma and the ordeal uh, one has gone through. And uh, uh, secondly, uh, 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 about the uh, uh, sexual torture, uh, last time when uh, Dr. Ellis Edward was uh, on the webinar, uh, I also posted the question uh, um, seeking uh, her advice that uh, it is the international internationally accepted uh, that there are three types of torture, physical, mental, and uh, sexual. And we have been uh, talking about the sexual torture uh, equally uh, as we do about the ma uh, mental and the uh, physical. But if you look at the, uh, the, the, the the definition given under the Article 1 of the UN CAT, uh, which we all uh, um, uh, are following. Uh, the term torture means any act by which we are pain or suffering, whether physical or mental. From here, the sexual torture is messy. Uh, do we not feel uh, the, uh, the need to uh, to 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 to, uh, 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 to jointly uh, formulate a um, uh, proposal? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, a resolution from this uh, forum, from the forum of the IRCT, uh, 
recommending to, uh, to uh, for its revisiting, re recommending to the United Nations for its revisiting and uh, incorporation of the word sexual torture. Uh, if uh, somebody was saying that the physical torture is uh, uh, is uh, the uh, uh, sexual torture, if physical torture is uh, really sexual uh, torture, but need uh, to discuss discuss it uh, separately. So this is my suggestion. Uh, that uh, and I wonder that uh, we could, uh, if we could uh, uh, move with this uh, proposal and uh, with this uh, recommendation to the United Nations, and especially the, we are uh, having uh, we are uh, we are having Dr. Ellis uh, in association with the IRCT and all the our centers. Uh, so uh, she should uh, advocate uh, our case and incorporate sexual torture news. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mohammed, and I believe uh, Grace is today with us. Um, she's uh, she's working with Dr. Ali, so I'm sure she will take notes of that. Um, but I'm actually mindful of the time, um, and we also wanted to discuss. So now we've been looking at how uh, stigma impacts both uh, again these three levels, right? Individual, family, um, uh, community, and how this then has an effect of. Uh, on, on the survivor um, uh, herself or himself. I would like now to maybe switch on to speaking about uh, what has been working um, and hearing about uh, experiences from anyone here in the call today, like Arish uh, was mentioning in Jordan, but uh, concretely Christy today, one of the panelists. Um, so Christy, if you can tell us a bit more about what specific interventions have you implemented to reduce stigma in Syria? Um, and also what measurable changes have you observed in, in community attitudes and behaviors? And then I'll take, we'll take the other hands. I'm seeing them. Okay, great. Thank you, Berta. And thanks everyone for your great participation. Uh, we're all learning a lot from each other, which is the most valuable thing. Um, so for seven, more than seven years, Synergy for Justice has been working with a local Syrian-led organization called Lawyers and Doctors for Human Rights. And we've been working in Syrian communities to address the myths and stereotypes that drive shame and stigma and impact uh, survivors, families, communities' ability to heal and move forward and access justice. Um, so, you know, as was mentioned earlier, uh, you know, our work is about shifting the stigma from the survivor to the perpetrator, because that's where it belongs. So the for uh, this is over seven years of work, so I'm going to try and be brief, but kind of hit the main points. We've worked in six different Syrian communities. Four are in Syria, one was in Jordan, and one was in Turkey. So we set out knowing intuitively and anecdotally that there's huge stigma associated with sexual violence and sexual torture that had been happening in Syria for more than a decade. But we, you know, of course, before we designed interventions, we needed to understand more about the, the knowledge, the attitudes, the, um, the misunderstandings, you know, what are the, the responses that people are bringing uh, and sort of confronting the survivors with when they return to communities. So we conducted a baseline knowledge and attitude survey before we started any interventions. We did this in all the communities. And we included 31 what we called stigma statements. Um, and they covered four different thematic areas related to perception, attitude, and knowledge related to the survivor, the family of the survivor, the perpetrator, and the community's acceptance or response to the survivor. So um, I, I'm gonna give you some examples of what those statements were so you understand a little bit better. So here's one. If a woman leaves the house alone, she must take responsibility if bad things happen to her. And so then respondents to the survey had a scale that they can agree, disagree, you know, not really sure about this. So there were 31 statements like that. Another one is um, women who do not cover their hair are more likely to be victims of sexual violence. A man cannot be a victim of sexual torture etc. cetera. Um, uh, sexual violence brings shame to the victim's family. So we, we conducted this baseline survey in all of the communities. You know, we consolidated the data 
Um, you know, we were very focused on that. And then following administration of the survey, lawyers and doctors for human rights worked in each community with community, we called them activists, people who are very invested in reducing stigma in the communities. LDHR worked with them to develop what we called stigma action plans. And these were to debunk myths, to raise awareness of rights, to kind of um, debunk, kind of to, to combat the rigid gender norms in some ways too, that, that fuel all of the myths and stereotypes. And ultimately, again, to shift the stigma from the survivor to the perpetrator. So um, each community had different stigma action plans. So the activities varied a little bit, but I'll give you a few examples of, of some of the ones we did. Um, so there were, for example, individual MHPSS sessions to identify and support people who had already suffered um, sexualized torture and, were, and then were of course suffering from stigma. And then there was follow-up, um, diagnoses, referrals, things like that. There was all kinds of awareness raising in small groups, in large groups, you know, some groups facing, uh, targeting adolescents, some groups targeting men only, whatever. So there were all different iterations of awareness raising groups. You know, these groups have to start out carefully. They're not gonna dive immediately in and, and start talking about sexual torture and stigma. So they start kind of um, in a more gentle or sensitive way, talking about gender norms, talking about the what are sort of the, the accepted gender roles for, for men and women and, and others in the community. And they start kind of, you know, very gently. And then they would over time move to the more difficult topics, the topics that were more controversial, more upsetting to people. They did meetings with camp managers, community leaders, religious leaders, NGOs, and they talked about the structural stigma that's probably impacting people in the communities. So the structures, the, the formal structures, meetings, things like that, they work to address that as well. So not just the internalized stigma of the survivor, not only the reaction, sort of the social stigma of the community, but also thinking about the structural stigma that needed to be sort of attacked and torn down basically. Um, they had some some channels on Telegram, you know, stop stigma with the, where the subscribers could get different messages about it. There were art competitions and art installations about stigma and its impact on individuals and communities. Film screenings. Um, they also talked about children born of rape and the associated stigma with that, because of course this is also a, a consequence of sexual torture. Um, so all different kinds of activities, um, focusing on different groups. And then, at, you know, after a certain period, it, it varied a little bit depending on the community. But then we um, conducted endline surveys as well to, to see if the stigma score had reduced at all. And if the stigma score reduces, it means there's less stigma in the community. And so, you know, we have all of these findings documented in a report. Um, perhaps my colleague Mira, who's on the phone call, could share the, the published stigma report that we have the link in the chat, please. Um, one of the things we found that was, was really interesting was that in places where the education level was, of course, oh, sorry, of course, it, for the survey respondents, we had disaggregated data about who they were, not names, but not identifying things, but age, gender, education level, et cetera. So one of the key things we found was that in areas where education and exposure to the outside was higher, the, stig the baseline stigma score was lower. So that was a really important key finding for us. And I think for donors and for others who are engaging in different areas, that not only activities that directly target stigma and, and gender stereotypes are important, but also general education is also important because that gives people a better starting place to start thinking about stigma associated with sexual torture and perhaps a more open mind to deal with it and to respond to survivors sensitively and in a trauma-informed way. Thank you, Berta, back to you. Thank you, Christy. Can, can you maybe um, uh, expand a bit more? What do you mean by general education? What, sure. What spaces? Yeah. Yeah, just anything. I mean, basically what we found was that like in some of the communities, for example, the education level was low. People maybe hadn't even had a high school education. And when they got, but then in the communities where we had more people who had completed high school, had some level of college education, 
and thereby more exposure to readings and writings of other people, more exposure to other people, they had a lower, lower negative um, sort of stigmatized impressions and, and um, myths stuck in their head, basically. So yeah, just a general education level, uh, not related to anything specific. Thank you, Christy. Um, and I see, I see two hands up, Manal and Arish. Um, I'm going to go immediately to you. I just wanted to, to maybe um, delve a bit because you're mentioning a lot this, um, I mean, you, 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 the work with community leaders and religious leaders uh, to combat structural stigma. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I'm wondering, is, did you do a previous work with them as, you know, to also deconstruct those type of uh, um, constructs or... Yeah. I was wondering. Yeah, no, what? it's a great question. So we with with Synergy and then with our partner lawyers and doctors for human rights, we did initial training for what we called the first responders in communities. So people who encounter survivors of sexual violence, either because they're medical professionals, mental health professionals, maybe educators, religious people, others who come into contact with a lot of people in the community and particularly survivors of violence. So we did training with them first, a lot of things on sexual violence, on debunking myths and stereotypes, on stigma. So first we, we did that training and got them on board. And then they became the ones in the community who drove the initiatives forward. And we were just kind of providing the, the initial training and the guidance and the framework on the outside. But then those community leaders, those community first responders were the ones who developed and drove the work forward. Perfect. Thank you so much, Christy, for, for sharing your experience uh, and compacting these seven years learnings. Um, into a few minutes, I can see that uh, your colleague is sharing uh, the report link on the chat. So make sure you you get it before the end of the call. So now we have we have two hands up, Manal and Arish. So if Manal, you wanna jump on mic? Yes, absolutely. Uh, can you hear me well? Great. Uh, yes. So um, my name is Manal. I am a social worker and I'm a, I'm a founder of a youth-led organization based in a refugee camp in Lebanon. I was personally born and raised in a refugee camp and uh, that has to do a lot with my experience as a social worker and my intervention. Uh, born and raised in the refugee camp has given me the experience to witness how the international community and the organizations who come from abroad to make intervention in, in uh, very vulnerable com communities is really unique. And um, most of the time, uh, organizations who come from abroad think that despite all the universal terms and experiences that we have, we exp experience the same thing and the solutions must be the same. And I totally disagree that um, with that because uh, it, it's really con contextualized and it depends on um, the, the, the community itself. Uh, a, lot of commu a lot of intervention programs usually become radical because they don't really understand how uh, the community works. Sometimes we think about the religious leaders as enemies, but we never think about how we should work hand in hand, as everyone mentioned before. So I personally worked as a, a mental health a mental health case manager. I worked uh, with Syrian uh, refugees, Palestinian refugees, women who were in prison, women who went back to prison because of stigma and torture. And I I've witnessed a lot about uh, how the bureaucracy in the intervention happens and influences uh, why women do not report and also they become numb about getting the support from the organizations because they actually reached a stage where, where they have the mistrust in the support providers. And that's actually uh, something that I brought up in a study that I recently conducted. Um, so uh, I truly believe that they have lost trust in the systems, including NGOs, community mobilizers, and even UN agencies. We tend to think that UN, agency, UN, UN agencies are the most important providers and the most effective ones. I'm personally, um, I, I benefit from, I used to benefit from uh, UNRWA, which is a UN agency based in, in uh, uh, areas where Palestinians are located to support them. However, this agency has 
truly failed to support women who experienced torture for so many reasons. So when I think about the, those huge agencies who design a, a huge programs to support us, I really need to see why the, this invested money is not uh, bringing out any uh, impact. And that's actually also affected by so many other factors that have, I personally brought in my study. But I could tell you that also women, we have different types of women who experience the same exact issue, which is torture and uh, gender-based violence, etc. But at the same time, their voices are not amplified even in the media. And um, in Lebanon, we have a lot of uh, organizations who do media campaigns to highlight and amplify the voices of women. But I never saw women who are Syrians or Palestinians or, or, or whatever from specific refugee camps are being amplified and they are mirrored in, in the campaigns. And, and, and we tend to think that that's, um, uh, yeah, we, we say that uh, just let's do awareness campaigns and media and whatever, but we never think how important this is because when you don't amplify them in the media campaigns, they do, we tend to normalize the, the experience. We, we sweep it under the table and we think it's uh, it's normal. And then when we come as uh, um, uh, frontliners to debate it on, on tables with the religious reader, leaders, we don't they tend to think that it's not important because it's not amplified in, in the media. Uh, so uh, it's it's very important that we make it very inclusive. And at the same time, it's uh, very important to highlight that uh, we must look at the perpetrators also as victims of violence. They themselves ha have experienced wars, economic crisis. They have experienced um, many gender-related uh, 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 roles that are burdened to them, and they're not aware how... Uh, when, you know, uh, they want to uh, play the role uh, that they have to play in the society as men is a burden as, at the same time, and it affects in a violent way their relationship within the family. So when we work uh, with women, uh, it's very important to make it inclusive to uh, to men as well and to make, to hear them. Maybe their stories could um, be unique as well. And th that's something that I try to do through my initiative in the refugee camp. I try to uh, build this support system with, with men and bring them to the table of discussion, bring a new concepts that uh, could be sensitive in the community, but at the same time that must be highlighted. And we try to talk about it. Uh, we, we try to, to say why, to, to, to discuss why violence is is there and what affects the at uh, affects it um so there are a lot of things to talk about but mm. i um i think that's what i wanted to to highlight so far yeah yeah thank you Manuel, for bringing your perspective and please make sure to share share the study um in the chat and also um if you could um if you could maybe provide us with the name of this initiative that you're uh, that you are working with um, and then I'll, I'll go to Arish, and I think we'll have to close it after Arish, but please stay for two more minutes. <laughs> go ahead, Arish. Okay, thank you. I think you, you have your experience. Yeah. Yes, I just want to just to share um, some points uh, quick, not that not have that much time. So I think, uh, my dear, is uh, we need to look for the, um, something related to judgmental cultures and the community who's labeling not just the survivor themselves, who's labeling the family at all. So from our experience, actually, uh, especially with Syrian, we know that Syrian communities uh, would like to have like early marriage for their daughters. So when the community discovering that there is one of the family members exposing sexual torture, even men or women, they will label all the family's member and it will be affected and to have that negative impact, for example, for their daughters on the long term and for the future. We can see that from our uh, uh, witnesses for our cases, they mentioned that if I, for example, reported that I exposed sexual torture or sexual violence, it will affect my daughter and the people will not come to marry them again and to have some uh, social relationship. So that's why we noticed that many of the survivors, they didn't like to speak up about what's going uh, uh, with them in their communities. Another issue is resilience. Resilience is very important, actually. 
And this word, it's like a magical word. We need to look for the resilience, especially in the individual level and the community level. It will affect also uh, how the, com if the community have that good resilience and if the individual or the case have that psychological re resilience is very well, it will be also affect on the community, how they can deal with the stigma and to look. And I would like from your, uh, uh, I would like to hear more regarding the connections and the relationship between the resilience and the stigma from our expertise in this uh, uh, webinar. The other issue is, I'm totally agree with what Chris said and mentions regarding the interventions, but sometimes we need to look for the community volunteers from the, from the community itself. It's very important actually, especially when we are talking about torture and very sensitive issues, because we consider them as the key for the service providers who are supporting and doing more assistance. So from our community volunteers and outreach volunteers who are supporting our work, who are supporting to communicate with, especially with isolated community, actually they support our work and they support our programming on the field. And also they uh, facilitate uh, with our uh, services and our programs, especially the group program, the group uh, activities is very sensitive and we need to take care if we need if we uh, uh, regarding the target group the participants and to take care of that uh, 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 looking for these participants together when they start to talk about the sexual torture so the community volunteers is very important the community committee also is very important because you know my dear uh, in the Zatari camp for example in Jordan and all of you knowing Zatari camp, the huge camp in Jordan, having different ethnic, having different people, having different, uh, 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 um, having different target group there. So the community committee, it's one of the most important initiatives. Actually, we conducted with different. Uh, uh, we have that a good expertise, and we are looking for the community structure. So we mentioned that community committee from different members, like uh, key leaders, like uh, med uh, some people who's working in the media, uh, some people who's uh, taking uh, the responsibility of community-based organization, like these committees supporting our uh, 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 work and they facilitate to approach these survivors, especially who didn't like to speak up and to cooperate with us. Sensitization workshop. This is also very important, uh, like a sensitization tool. So from the community volunteers and uh, a very qualified volunteers with, uh, with good educational background, they conducted many of the sensitization workshops in the community. At least they can understand the needs and the priority. So sometimes uh, many of the organizations, unfortunately, they designed their project, their program, so far from the needs and the priority for the community. So doing sensitization workshop, we can understand the needs and the priority for this community. Based on the results, we start to think about the new methods and tools we can use in the awareness mm -hmm. session. You mm -hmm. know, sometimes we first before, we have that classical way of the awareness sessions, like a lecture and Mm. Uh, having a presentation and the people of they didn't like to continue sometimes and it's so mm. boring so based on the sensitization workshop we are asking the community what do you want from us as uh, 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 the roles of the community change uh, it changed from the receptor mm. and they sharing us on the same table of their thoughts their uh, uh, methods and tools they prepared so currently uh, I worked with the uh, uh, some uh, community initiatives, and they discussed, for example, to have a theater, to have a drama, which is directly uh, affect the emotional and the thoughts. And by this way, we can change. And the, you know, the actors, it's from the community themselves. So we can see that we use a structured program. We use a structured initiative, community initiative, but uh, and we designed in the very logical and professional way. So after that, we can measure the impacts of our work. Mm -hmm. And also, 
I would like from this actually webinar to, uh, uh, if there is also many of the, if there is any collaborations with the expertise here in this webinar, I'm so welcoming to sharing the experience together. Of, or, or if there is any program that you would like to share with me, I'm opening and would love to do more communication and collaboration. Thank you, my dear. Exactly. Thank you, Arish, for this. Uh, lots, lots of notes I'm taking. Um, and hopefully we will be able to share kind of uh, the, the, the key learnings after this session. I'm also aware of the time, but I would like to uh, give the floor to Eugenia and then maybe we can close with uh, Shirette. Um, on the meantime, I will kindly ask Andrea to pull out the, the, the poll, the survey, so that you can evaluate this space, and especially if you like this new format. Um, so yeah, go ahead, so, Eugenia. So Yes, so thank you so much to IRA City for organizing this webinar. And many thanks for the rich learning and sharing uh, that has actually taken place. I actually was going to share our experiences working with the community, engaging the community, um, working with groups, our group-based approach in managing stigma. I was also going to talk about uh, working with traditional cultural leaders um, and doing a lot of psychoeducation. I was also going to talk about the use of uh, uh, survivors in these processes um, in order to address stigma. I'm aware of the time uh, better, um, and I'm hoping that we'll have more time to share. And I'm happy about colleagues who are talking about probably the need to engage further um, and discuss some of these issues. Quite a lot in common. And I think, yes, we can learn so much from each other. But otherwise, thank you so much. I, I, I will not take more time and over. No, thank you so much, Eugenia. I actually feel bad because as always, we were running out of time. <laughs> mm. um, but let, let us rethink if this uh, this topic, uh, as many of the colleagues today address, this, this is an yeah. issue that needs to be further discussed. So let's consider if, we, if we're doing a parallel space for us to continue this discussion. Um, but yeah, with that, Shiret, if you Thank want you. to have the closing remarks. Um, I want to have this closing, wonderful webinar that we had today. And I loved how we, uh, we were so engaged with each other. Um, from my point of view, as a survivor, I think it's very important that how IRCT put forward survivors, how we have a voice, how we can participate. This is really important, number one. And number two, to break the stigma, I think as me as a survivor, from my point of view is, let's educate young generation. That is where we can kill stigma. That's where we know that we are not, we will never die. We, will, uh, we are heroes. And that's where we will never be forgotten. Thank you so much for this wonderful webinar. And I appreciate all of you for listening and being participating in this wonderful webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sharetta. Thank you so much for these excellent closing remarks. I think there's nothing to add from, from our side. Uh, I will thank you all for being online today with us. Sorry about these uh, 10 minutes um, more that, I, that we had you with us. Uh, the next in the next session, we will be discussing uh, this, well, disclosure and documentation of cases of sexual torture. So I will encourage you to also log in. Uh, that's going to be on the 23rd of October at the same time. Um, so, yeah. And I want to thank the, the wonderful panelists that were uh, also testing this new format with us today, Christy, Eugenie, and, and Charette. Um, and for the rest, please let us know how this new format, uh, if, if this new format works out better, because then we will continue 
with that. And last but not least, the wonderful interpreters, uh, interpret in interpreters, God, and their wonderful work uh, again with uh, with interpreting our words. Thank you so much, and please feel free to unmute and say goodbye. Put on your camera so we can say <laughs> bye in a proper manner. <laughs> Ciao everyone. Bye. Thank bye you bye. very much. Bye. 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 Happy with bye. us. Yes, Amazing yes. space. Muy bien. Gusto. Bye. Bye. Nice bye. space. Bye. Bye. Gracias. Bye. Everybody. Bye. Gracias. Bye. 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 Oh, ciao. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye. 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 Abu Bakr. Bye, Muhammad. Hello. Hey, Bye. All right, Juma. Ciao, Arish. Yeah. Nice job. Thank Drive you, safe. Lisa, Drive safely there, Arish. Yeah. <laughs> I see you. Bye. Ciao. Hey. Good.